हाँ यस सर गुड इवनिंग सर ओके सो ओके सो बेसिकली इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी डिस्कस सम ऑफ द रिजल्ट्स लेट अस रिकॉल इट क्विकली या सो इन दिस कोरोलरी वी डिस्कस थ्री पार्ट्स so first is domain is finite dimensional and we have a linear function the uh, so <clears throat> we have a linear function f where the domain is finite dimensional then the following statements holds <clears throat> so first statement is that f is a homeomorphism uh, which is onto if and only if f is bijective the second condition is all norms on x x is a finite dimensional norm linear space so all the norms on x are equivalent so that means any two norms we take on x one is stronger than other other is stronger than the first one and uh, every finite dimensional norm linear space is complete so in third part what essentially we are trying to say is that we have constructed a bijective linear function f from k n to x where x is n dimensional vector space x is n dimensional vector space so corresponding to n we are considering k n and then we are defining a linear map f from k n to x which is bijective so f is bijective that means essentially we are identifying capital x with k n right because we have a one one on two linear function from x to k n and x is n dimensional so using this isomorphism that is basically homeomorphism here uh, not homeomorphism basically it is a isomorphism of vector spaces so if we identify x with kn using this one one on to linear map then we can whatever norm we can have on k and we can assign on x using this isomorphism so on k and we are first considering euclidean norm right so with respect to euclidean norm k and is complete and then since x we can identify with k and x is complete with respect to euclidean norm which we are assigning on k and and then once x is finite dimensional vector space which is complete with respect to one norm it is complete with respect to all other norms that is the second result which we are using here so any two norms on a finite dimensional norm linear space are equivalent and whenever we have a equivalent norms if that vector space is complete with respect to first norm it is also complete with respect to the other norm so that is the essentially this third part so what, what we are discussing in previous lecture and then we discuss this last proposition that says that whenever range is finite dimensional and uh, we have a linear continuous function this condition is equivalent to the condition that the kernel is closed so in earlier result we have mentioned two parts kernel is closed and f tilde is continuous but here f tilde is continuous because the domain of f tilde which is the quotient space is finite dimensional so to prove that the quotient space is finite dimensional we need to show that quotient space is generated by finitely many elements so we are not saying this is a basis but the basis 
is a subset of this that is what we are saying because this has two condition one is linearly independent and span the first thing we are saying here is that we have assumed that the range is generated by fx1 fx2 fxm and using that we proved that any element of the quotient space is combination of these elements so therefore quotient space which is a quotient by kernel of f that is a linear combination of x1 plus zf and so on xm plus zf so this is one condition of this is verified only thing we need to check is this set is linearly independent so if this set is not linearly independent we can remove one by one elements and we can uh, reduce this set so we have studied in linear algebra reduction of spawning set and we can make it into a basis so that we can use and that way we can find x quotient Z, zf has dimension less than equals to m so therefore it is a finite dimensional vector space and once we have a function which is linear defined on finite dimensional vector space that is always continuous so that result we have discussed that will give the last property last statement that f theta is continuous so <clears throat> this is what we discussed in the previous lecture today we want to discuss inner product spaces so we already know inner product spaces which are finite dimensional but now we, we uh, now we want to discuss infinite dimensional vector spaces which is inner product so <clears throat> We know uh, there are several examples of inner product spaces. Let us start with the simplest one. So if, if we have the vector space that is Kn, we know that it is a vector space with respect to coordinate wise addition and coordinate wise scalar multiplication. So on this vector space, we need to define the function. So inner product is a function from x cross x to k defined by so we are defining this inner product of two vectors. So first vector is x1 x2 xn its inner product with y1, y2, yn. This we are defining to be x1, y1 conjugate times w1 plus w2 x2 y2 conjugate and the last is wn xn yn conjugate so here what are this w1 w2 wn they are they are called weight so they are some real numbers and since we need that positive semi definite property of inner product these numbers must be non negative so what are the w1 w2 wn they are positive real numbers so we can easily check that this map is a inner product so for example the first property is that it preserves uh, yeah so that part is very simple so let us just note that note that this map is a
in our product on KN and uh, to get the standard in a product on KN we have to take each weight to be zero uh, each weight to be one so w1 is one w2 is one and wn is also one so that means all these numbers will be one so then you will get the standard in a product that is summation over j x j y j conjugate that is the usual euclidean in a product So this is just a simple example of a finite dimensional inner product space. Another example is whenever we take x equals to L2. So if you recall this, L2 is the set of all sequences. Such that summation modulus xj square is convergent so <clears throat> this xj are basically complex numbers uh, real or complex numbers depending on whether k is real number or k is the set of complex number so all sequences uh, that the corresponding series modulus of square that is a convergent series. So we know L2 is a vector space with respect to entry wise addition and scalar multiplication. Right, so it is already a vector space. The question is whether L2 is an inner product space. So to define inner product, we, we need to use this condition. Because that is the only information given in the definition of L2. So <clears throat> what we know is we know that <coughs> if we have two elements of L2, so let us take x is x1, x2, xn, and y is equals to y1, y2, yn. Suppose these two are elements of L2. So they are elements of L2 means what? The sequence, the corresponding series modulus square the series is convergent and similarly for the y series these two series are convergent that is meaning that these two elements belong to L2 Right, so now we want to define the inner product between x and y. So, so we know that the inner product is basically the map from the vector space to elements of the vector space, which gives element of k. So if we define Take any two sequences x1, x2, xn. So basically, this is the element x in a block with y. We want to define this in a product. If we define in the usual way, uh, the Euclidean way, then 
of course this is not the euclidean inner product because there are infinitely many coordinates but still we can define it in the same way so we'll get x1 y1 conjugate x2 y2 conjugate and so on so if we define by this way what is the first problem we need the element belongs to k right so output is this what is this this is basically summation in the summation notation this is xj yj conjugate so output is this but this may not be real or complex number right it is real or complex number if and only if the series is convergent right so first thing we need to check that this if 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 you want to define this map in this way this series is convergent or not right so to check that is convergent what we need to check there are this is a series so for convergence of series there are many ways one of the way is that if this series converges absolutely then it converges so to check the convergence let us take first modulus of the series so this is a very important way uh, which we usually use in even in integral also we first take the modulus then we know that this modulus is less than or equals to summation modulus xj yj conjugate right so this we can write only when this series is convergent so to check this series is convergent what we will do we will first take the finite sum j1 to n modulus xj yj conjugate and then we will apply this is a finite sum so we'll apply the cauchy squares inequality we have proved cauchy squares inequality the cauchy squares inequality says that this is less than or equals to summation j1 to n modulus x j square square root of this times square root of y j square right so this always holds because this is the sum of finitely many numbers right so that is always a finite number but here we are adding infinitely many numbers right j is 1 to infinity so our goal is to show that this series is convergent first we have considered the nth partial sum of this series nth partial sum is bounded by these two terms and these two terms are basically partial sum of these two convergent series that is our assumption x and y belongs to l2 that means these two series is convergent these two series converges that means their partial sum converges So since their partial sum is a monotonic sequence, this is less than or equals to j1 to infinity modulus of xj square j1 to infinity modulus of yj square. Right. So this is. I think so is it correct what I have written is Cauchy square inequality is correct okay so this happens now <clears throat> now what what next we can do 
this is a fixed number this is a fixed number so what can we say about this term as n tends to infinity so this is a term of non negative term series and it is bounded by this fixed number this is a fixed number it does not depend on n right because we have already taken n tends to infinity on the right side but in this term we have not taken n approaches to infinity so now we can do that so therefore as n approaches to infinity we get limit n tends to infinity summation j is equals to 1 to n xj yj conjugate this term is less than equals to square root of 1 to infinity xj square so this is what we get and then if we take n tends to infinity what we get is basically we get here infinity so this term is less than equals to this particular real number or uh, yeah so this is a real number because we are taking modulus square so therefore this series converges absolutely Right, so now this series is convergent, so therefore some of the series is a real or complex number, and therefore we can define it. And for this is element of k, so that means this map we can define. The output is element of k. So this is just we have defined the map. Now we need to check all the properties of whether it is a preserving the addition in first variable scalar multiplication and all that so those things are very similar to uh, checking the euclidean in a product satisfy those properties so let us write down the remark that using the properties of convergent series It is easy to check that this map satisfies all the properties of the definition of In a product. So therefore, L2 is a inner product space with respect to this inner product. And uh, note that L2 is infinite dimensional. So that we have already mentioned that L2 is infinite dimensional. In a product space. So this is the first example. Second example comes from the set of integrable functions. 
square integrable function. So this little l2, l infinity, and l1 spaces are analog of Lebesgue integrable functions l1, l2, and l infinity. So in particular, we take x to be l2 of e, where e is either the set of real number or uh, e is the compact set, close interval a, b. So when we take e is close interval a, b, we'll integrate the function from a to b. And when we have the function over L2 infinity, we will integrate the function from min minus infinity to infinity over the whole real line. So define. So I think you have not seen this type of Lebesgue integrable function, but at least you know what are the Lebesgue integrable function over the closed interval AB. So you just consider those functions. So define the inner product x with y. So x and y are Lebesgue integrable function on closed interval a, b. Then we define the inner product to be the same way, the way we define here. So here we have taken summation, but now since these are integrable function, we'll integrate from closed interval a, b, a to b, x t, y t, conjugate. And with respect to the measure, whatever here taking on close interval a b so usually we consider Lebesgue measure but if we consider the discrete measure and we take it to be a countable set then this example will give the previous example of little l2 as a special case because in that case the integral will become summation so those things uh, we are not going in details, but just remember that second example is in fact the special case of this example. And uh, when we take the discrete measure, so again now the question is when when this integral converges. So here also we'll use the Cauchy square inequality. The Cauchy square is inequality for Lebesgue integration that gives us integrable functions. We get so. Can you recall what is the Cauchy square inequality for Lebesgue integrable functions? So that is integral of x t y t conjugate this is less than equals to what we'll get uh, yes uh, anurag ye yeah, apply karenge is pe koshish kar dene ke liye to kya milega so this is basically integral a to b Okay, so if you don't remember, let me write down. It is an integral modulus of x t square square root of this times integral over e y t square dmt. Okay, so this is standard Cauchy square inequality when we have a inner product in terms of integral. So because this and this are convergent because 
x and y are in L2, these two are convergent, so therefore this integral converges, and therefore we can define this map from so this is a map from L2E cross L2E2 set of complex numbers. So this what is L2E? L2 is uh, yeah, so here. L2E is the functions x from e to k such that the integral of xt square is convergent. And uh, this is a miserable function. Miserable over it. So these two are the examples where the inner product is coming from the, the Cauchy square inequality. Now the converse is that in every example it may not be in this way. So suppose we have an inner product, can we prove? Cauchy square inequality as a implication of inner product space. So, for example, standard Euclidean inner product is inner product space, and in which we usually derive Cauchy square inequality as an application of that. So, if we have a any inner product space. On x, uh, yes, is an inner product on on the vector space x. So whenever we have inner product space, then it will imply the Cauchy square inequality. So Cauchy square inequality is. modulus of inner product xy because xy inner product xy is a complex number so its modulus is less than or equals to square root of inner product xx times square root of inner product y1 so this is true for all x and y elements of x so this is cos inequality second inequality is mean cos this inequality So Minkowski inequality is square root of inner product x plus y, x plus y. So we know all this inequality in terms of norm. So this is basically norm of x plus y. That is less than equals to square root of xx plus square root of yy. So proof is very trivial and uh, it follows from the first step of gram smith orthogonalization so if you recall the gram smith orthogonalization what we do is we take x minus inner product x y divided by norm y y divided by norm y right so we will begin by this particular step so for that what we to prove the Cauchy square inequality We'll start with considering the element Z that is defined to be so norm Y is what basically it is square root of Y in a product Y Y. So therefore we are considering in a product Y Y X. We have multiplied this in a product Y Y on uh, with X minus inner product xy with y so if we consider our z to be this element then clearly 
the inner product of z with z is non negative number and uh, then we know that z is this number so when we take its inner product with itself the first term we will get is inner product y y so inner product of this element with this element is inner product y y inner product x y inner product y x so that is the first term in a plug with the other term the next term we'll get is in a product y y so this term with itself that is y y x x y y now the second term with itself that we we'll have okay so first with negative sign second with positive sign third this term with itself that is a positive sign so that is x y y y y x we are using it is conjugate linear in second variable and then the second term with first one so negative sign x y y x y y so this is basically in a product z with z and then we can see that some of the term will cancel so the last two terms in fact we have y x y x x y x y and y y y y so these two terms will cancel out so only remaining will be two terms so that is zero less than or equals to <clears throat> minus y y and, and x y y x we can write as so that is z z bar so therefore it is modulus x y square and the the last term that is plus y y x x y y so this is what we get and in in this this term is repeating y y is repeating so that will give us two cases if inner product y y is zero so in that case we know that when inner product is zero y is a zero vector and hence in this case it is trivial that inner product x y is less than equals to x x y y because this is zero and this is zero so in this case we are done the other case is y y is non zero so if y y is non zero then let us call it equation number star so then using star So what is inner product y y inner product y y we know that if we take inner product of same element with itself it is always not greater than equals to zero and if it is non zero that means it is a positive number positive dim number so whenever inner product y y is non zero inner product y with y is positive number so we can cancel that number and therefore we get modulus x y square is less than or equal to x x y y right and then both the side we will take the square root so finally we get in a product x y is less than or equal to square root x x square root y y so this is the cis for the inequality now the second part is that we want to show the minkowski inequality so for minkowski inequality we will start with the left side that is in a product xy x plus y x plus y so x plus y x plus y in a product so when we use the inner product is 
preserves addition in both the variables, we'll get this equals to xx plus xy plus yx plus yy. And then this is a complex number. So in a product xy plus yx, that is z plus z conjugate. So that is two times the real part of z. So we get two times real part of xy plus y1 what we are using because z plus z conjugate is two times the real part of z and then <clears throat> we know that real part of z is less than equals to modulus z so again using complex numbers because real part of z is less than equals to mod z so therefore real part of in a product xy is less than equals to modulus of in a product xy and then we know that using Cauchy squares inequality that is less than equals to square root x x square root y y So that is basically square root xx plus square root yy square. So this is a perfect square now. All right, so now we can take the square root both the side. So the square root of this equals to inside this bracket. So this is the Cauchy, uh, the Minkowski inequality, what we have obtained. Okay, so more or less you already know all these things from the inner product spaces, but all these things will be useful to conclude that the inner product map is continuous function. So let us see this proposition. So if we have a inner product space, then we know that every inner product gives us a norm All right so we can define the norm of x that is coming from the inner product as square root of xx so this we already know and once we get the norm then the Cauchy squares inequality we can write in terms of norm that is in a product of x y is less than equals to norm x norm y right so see there and further the inner product map is continuous You know that inner product is a map from x cross x to k. So to prove inner product is continuous, we need to show that whenever xn converges to x, yn converges to y in x, it implies that inner product of xn with yn over these two in the product x with y so this is this property is basically the map in a product is continuous function 
this property is useful so note that this is a noun of noun so this we know from linear algebra that every inner product gives a corresponding noun so only thing we need to check here is that inner product is a continuous function so to, to check inner product is continuous Let us take two sequences. So let xn converge to x and yn converge to y in the norm linear space x because now x has a norm. So with respect to this norm, we have two sequences which is convergent. What we need to check, we need to show that in a product xn yn converge to in a product xy. So inner product x y x n y n the output is a complex number. The value of the inner product is a complex number. That is the element of k. So that means in modulus we need to show that x n y n converges to x y. That means the difference between these two elements goes to zero in modulus as n approaches to infinity. Right. So to check that, what we will do is we will add and subtract the corresponding term. So corresponding term means what we'll do is here there are four terms xn, yn, x, and y. So what we'll do is we'll combine the first element with the last element. So that means in a product x and y that element will add and subtract so the value will not change both of these elements are same and now we will take the cosy square uh, we'll use the triangle inequality so that will give first two terms modulus plus modulus of second two terms why we are combining first two and second two because we will use the property of inner product that if you have these two terms then the first element is same so it can be written in this form right so that is the first element plus second element the second element is same right in this second element of the inner product is same so that is basically xn minus xy so we are using the inner product is preserves addition in first and second variable and then now we can use cosy squares inequality so this term is less than equals to norm of xn times norm of yn minus y plus norm of xn minus x times norm of y so as n approaches to infinity since yn converges to y and xn converges to x this term converges to zero this converges to zero as n approaches to infinity so again we know that xn is a convergent sequence so norm xn is bounded sequence and if we have a sequence converges to zero any fixed number non-zero number times that sequence also converges to zero so all these properties of sequence we are using in terms of norm here the sequences are not of real number the sequence is are elements of 
elements of the sequence are elements of nonlinear series. So this will give us this element converges to x y. Is n tends to infinity. Therefore, inner product map is continuous. So, in the next lecture, we'll start transmit orthogonality for the infinite dimensional vector space. We already know Gram Smith orthogonality from the inner product space, but we have considered finite dimensional inner product species. There is a similar statement of Gram Smith process for infinite dimensional, and uh, so that thing we will discuss in next lecture. So, what is our goal? Our goal is that we need to find coordinates with respect to infinite orthonormal basis so we already know how to find coordinate of a vector in finite dimensional vector space but now what we are going to do is we are going to find the coordinates of a vector with respect to infinite dimensional orthonormal basis so like fourier series so fourier series we have a continuous function we find its coordinates a1 a2 an b1 b2 bn with respect to the infinite dimens infinitely many eigenfunctions so you may have come across this notion of eigenfunctions in differential equation so that is the basically the fourier part fourier analysis part that we have a infinite dimensional inner product spaces in which we have ortho normal set then how to find the coordinates of element of that infinite dimension in a product space with respect to the orthonormal basis so in next couple of lecture we'll do that okay so let me stop today lecture here